Good evening, everyone. It is 5.30 p.m. on Wednesday, July 19th, 2023. And this regular meeting of the Sandpoint City Council is now called to order in Council Chambers at City Hall, 1123 West Lake Street in Sandpoint, Idaho. Under the city's recently adopted Code of Ethics and Civility as the presiding offer, officer, I'm to identify law enforcement personnel in the room who will be serving as Sergeant at Arms for this evening's meeting. Tonight, we have Police Chief Corey Kuhn with us back there. All right. Thank you for keeping us all safe and in line, Corey. Appreciate that. For the record, I'm Mayor Shelby Ronstadt presiding. Also present are Councilors Kate McAllister, Deb Rule, Joel Spiro, Jason Welker, and Justin Dick. Councilor Andy Grote is absent this evening. Uh, if everyone will now please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, we have some special business to attend to this evening before we get underway with our regular agenda, and I'll try. I'll now yield the floor to Police Chief Corey Kuhn. Did you bring the doggy? We did. <laughs> okay. We did. We're here for a special reason, and it has nothing to do with me. Uh, if Jeremy, you want to bring Bindi up? We're really here for uh, for Bindi. Uh, for those of you that don't know, Bindi came to work with us in, in March of 2016. Uh, she's been with us for about seven years. She, she is, uh, we often get asked what kind of dog she oh. is. And I have to always go back. So it's a labrad labradoodle. Is what I was a labradoodle. Yeah. We usually, most of our dogs come us usually from pounds or rescues when we get adopted them. So some of that, it's a little bit known. But I want to give you kind of a quick history about Bindi. She's been with us for about seven years, like I said, from March of 2016. Uh, they go through an intense training program. We identify a handler in this case. Uh, Jeremy was identified as a handler. So he's had her with him for the past seven years. And I say her with him, it's also her with him and, and the family, because not only when they're at work, they're with Jeremy, but when they're at home, they're with Jeremy and the family. And the, this becomes really a, a family task to be a canine handler in our agency, because the family takes on a lot of those burdens. Um, and so just a, a quick history with some of the stuff she's done. She's had, uh, I'm just going to say several, several deployments within our agency, uh, several large finds of narcotics. She's a narcotics dog, not a bite dog. So she locates narcotics. She's been deployed, not in our County, not only in our County, but she's also worked Cooney County, Boundary County. Um, she's had cases with Jeremy that's went all the way up to the federal trial, federal courts, which she's won um, there. They've been certified and in Idaho, to be certified as a cane line and a handler, you got to pass with 100%. It's not a 50% you're good enough. It's a 100% either pass or fail kind of an exam. Uh, seven times for the seven years they've, they've done it, they've done it without an issue. Um, Bindi is an absolute, of, of the dogs that we've had, probably the top dog that we've had. She's mm. absolutely amazing. She's got a, a work ethic and a drive that outmatches her handlers, hand down. <laughs> hands, hands, hands down. She could probably actually outwork any of the officers. She is... She's been a, just a phenomenal, a phenomenal dog for us. Unfortunately, in, in March of this year, if you guys remember right, it was February, February of this year, according to my notes, um, Jeremy and, and Bindi was responding to help Ponderay. And when they were responding to help Ponderay, um, the guy, the, the suspect fled, ended up going into his lane of traffic and hit him head on. If you remember, I think I showed that video back then. In that, at first, we didn't think Bindi was injured. Um, after Jeremy got cleared, came back to work, and we started to try to put her into the car and work, she started having some behavior changes. She became anxious, um, started panting, pacing. Uh, her focus wasn't quite there. We started tearing the car apart. We noticed the cage when when they hit head on. Actually, the rear metal, metal cage actually was dented in um, where she struck the car. She spent the last five months going to vets, um, doing multiple tests and exam. And, and really what it's come back to is we've been told that she has a basically a PTSD. She starts to to shake. Um, she doesn't act right when she starts to get into the patrol cars. Um, we had uh, Keith Hutchinson, who's uh, he's a, one of our state certifi certifiers. He's been doing it for about 18 years, and he's watched them certify before. We had him come up last month, run her through the test, and he and he came out and kind of said the same thing. Um, Bindi's not the same dog as before the accident, and, and it was his recommendation and the vets that we moved to retire her <clears throat> and kind of let her enjoy her life. 
um, with the years of service that she's done. So really today is a chance since she is she is property of the department to to relinquish that property, um, give her a chance to go out and be a dog, um, have her place with Jeremy, the family who's willing to take on that responsibility for her moving forward. So we're we're indeed grateful for the services she's rendered, uh, for the time that she's put up with us. And so we, we'd just like to have that uh, move forward with. Do you want to say anything? No? Yes? Just, I actually thank the city for allowing us to get the dog. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Without your support, your approval, she wouldn't have brought us the same thing. Mm -hmm. So, say thank you for that. Yeah, our pleasure. Um, off, officer, can uh, counsel and myself pet the dog? Yeah. <laughs> you want to run her up and around? <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> like, yeah. I walk her Is there, Do you guys have any questions? <laughs> Usually she's adorable. She's adorable. working right now. She's like right now. She likes treats. Hey, you have no treats. I'm not doing. I know. She's. Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Chief. Yeah. So, Thank Chief, you. I will say that before I came here tonight, I was going through my council packet and I read the resolution for Bindi's retirement out loud to my family. And it's the only council agenda item that literally made my <laughs> whole family cry. <laughs> I'm not joking. Like it was it was like a you know Hallmark movie. <laughs> it is. It is. It is for us. It's really, really sad. sad too, really sad. Because we are we are losing a member of our family in that aspect. So yeah, but also happy. I mean, she gets but to happy. Retire. She gets to be a dog, yeah. which is amazing. Even talking with uh, Autumn, who said even the last month that we kind of let her stay at home, she's her whole personality has changed. Mm. She just gets to be a dog, so mm. which is awesome. Mm. So thank you, Chief. Chief I have a question. Yep. Um, is it? Pretty much any breed can be appropriately trained to be a canine working dog or? Most breeds can. Really what they look for is a dog with a really high play drive and that ability just to continue on to go, go, go. So most, there are breeds that are better. The labs, the labradoodles are usually a better breed. Plus for us, when you get in the narcotics, um, you can walk into the schools and not worry about them. So you can get in the German Shepherd families and those, which makes great dogs too. But then you always have that concern of, um, aggressive behavior at the same time so hmm. we most of the dogs that we've had have been a form of a lab because of that hmm. no chihuahuas no chihuahuas <laughs> i would like a chihuahua <laughs> yeah thank you appreciate that okay so i would like to entertain a motion approving the resolution for the retirement of canine officer bindi officially releasing her from duty to the care of corporal jeremy in Missouri. Motion? So moved. moved. Back Parker. Been moved and seconded. By everyone. This will be a roll call vote. Councillor McAllister? Yes. Councillor Rule? Yes. Councillor Welker? Yes. Councillor Dick? Yes. Councillor Spurl? Yes. Motion passes. Um, next, I'd like to, uh, next is announcements. I'd like to take a moment to reflect on the train and vehicle collision that occurred um, over this weekend up in the Selig Valley. Uh, claiming the lives of three members of our community, a young family, a father and a mother and a young child. And if we could just uh, please have a moment of silence. Thank you for that. Um, council, any announcements? Uh, Mr. Mayor? Yeah. I have one question for perhaps Jennifer. Um, this is a question I've been getting from people via text for the last week. Um, the status of North Boyer by the airport. Yes. Um, there seems to be confusion whether that's a county project, a city project. Can you, mm -hmm. And could you give us a little update on that and let us know who people should contact with questions or perhaps address some of those questions? I can answer your question and appreciate it because I know it has been confusing and people have been in our offices and calling over the last couple of weeks about it too. Um, for clarification, it is a county project. Um, it's an airport project specifically, which the airport falls under the county. So 
it's a realignment of uh, North Boyer along the airport to move the roadway out of the uh, critical zone. So it's a federally funded project for the safety of the airport in the community. And they were hoping to actually get the project going last year. And there were a number of delays and we appreciate uh, the impacts on the community. And it's unfortunate to have that going on at the same time that we've got ITD's project on 2200 on Fifth Avenue as well. So uh, we understand it's making north-south traffic um, backed up and difficult to navigate at times, but that is a county project. Um, we do have a requirement that they have that project completed by early fall. Timing was a real challenge with that one because it's not ideal in summer months. And then during the school year, that's a primary route for our school buses as well. So unfortunately, there really wasn't a very good time uh, uh, to have that. And I think uh, uh, there have been some calls that looks like from community members contacting Road and Bridge and they, at the county, and they've been advised it wasn't a county project, but I think it's because it's an airport project. Right. So okay. thank, thank you, you for the question. I appreciate that. Uh, Council, any other announcements? Can, may I, Mr. Mayor, if we're going to do some updates, Jennifer, would you mind updating us on the design competition and when the um, unveiling and the public engagement process would start with that? Uh, yes, so we have the um, updated timeline posted on the front page of our website uh, for the design competition, and we are on schedule with the updated schedule. Uh, we're in stage two of the design competition. We have three teams that are working um, on uh, their uh, challenge, and uh, their uh, concepts are due to us August 1st. And then what will happen right after that is that it's reviewed by our competition managers, making sure that they met the criteria for the competition. They will officially go on display both electronically and in person starting August 5th. Uh, so we will have that up on our website, have announcements about that electronically, and the public will be able to provide feedback electronically. Um, in addition to that, uh, starting on the 5th, that will be our first time for display boards that the public can see. Um, I will be down at Farmer's Market that morning um, at Jeff Jones Square, both that, that Saturday as well as the following Saturday with the display boards, and people will be able to do written comments there as well. And then we will be coming out with a schedule for times both during the day and in the evening that they'll be on display here at City Hall uh, so that people who have questions, there's somebody available on staff that can answer any questions people will have. Um, so ultimately, it will go from public display on the 14th to jury review um, immediately. Uh, after that, so a reminder that that jury review is really about a technical review um, of the projects and they will we will be sharing all of the public comments with the juror as well. And this will be coming back to Council on August 16th with a recommendation for the team that moves on to phase three. So thank you. It's been a while, but um, we are getting there on the timeline and again. Um, the reason that originally we would have been further along in the design competition, we originally planned to be in phase three now. The reason for the extended timeline is that was at the request of the teams um, because there are some very complex challenges. And um, so the teams asked more time for more time that they could dig into our master plans and really come up with their recommendations. We've had uh, previews with all three teams one time through, we've had two other teams take us up on an opportunity for a uh, technical review a uh, second time. And uh, I think the community is going to be really pleased with um, what they see and uh, counsel what you expected out of this. We should be seeing those in presentations. So. Thank you. Right. Any other announcements from city council? Right. Staff, announcements? Uh, just quickly. Um, my special event announcements and um, factoid before I get into what we have in the next couple of weeks. Already this year, not halfway through the year, we've permitted 53 special events. So 
Um, once again, we're on new record for special events this year. It's pretty much constant in here. We're talking about them daily. Um, so upcoming special events uh, starting, first one starting tomorrow night, which will be the first of a series of three events. Uh, Sandpoint Summer Concert Series is back in Farm and Park. Uh, so uh, that event has been permitted and it's free and open to the public uh, tomorrow evening. Uh, we have a permit. We're in the process of um, final issuance on for the 22nd, and that's for a block party, which block parties have become very popular around town. This one is on Florence Street uh, on July 27th, um, Suzuki String Family Concert. Uh, that has been permitted. They will be in Farm and Park that day. We typically had the Cottage Market in Farm and Park on Sundays. Uh, Cottage Market will be off that Sunday with Suzuki String Family Concert in the park that day. And then we have another block party on Florence that will be on uh, August 4th. And of course, upcoming both through a lease and through a permit uh, festival of Sandpoint. So uh, we have a busy few weeks coming up. All right. Thank you for that. Next on the agenda is a public is the public forum portion of the meeting, which allows the public the opportunity to address myself and council on items either on the consent calendar or on any item not listed on the agenda. If anyone here in the chambers wishes to speak on such an item, there's a comment card you can fill out at the front table there by the door. Please fill that out and hand that to uh, any staff person at the back table there. If you're on Zoom and wish to participate, you will raise your hand at this time. Um, to accommodate those who wish to speak during general items uh, during the public forum, as well as those who wish to speak on specific business items on our agenda. A total of 20 minutes will be allotted here at the beginning of the meeting. If you'd like to speak and did not have an opportunity to do so, we will reopen the public forum at the end of our regular agenda to give those who did not get an opportunity to speak an opportunity to speak. So I'll now recite the rules and procedure for public comment during the during the meeting. And this is, of course, for the public comment portion of the meeting, as well as for uh, public comment periods during any agendized items. First, council may not hear or take testimony during public forum or in any planning and zoning matter that is before the city or is known to be a likely application. Such testimony is only allowed during a properly noticed public hearing specific to that matter. Matters that have been previously heard and decided by the council may be determined to be inappropriate for public comment, for public form, excuse me. Those in attendance shall not engage in disorderly or boisterous conduct, use, use threatening or abusive language, hold up or display any type of sign, speak out of turn or clap or engage in any other similar act which disturbs the meeting. Comments shall not be personally derogatory nor shall they be personally directed at any individual organization or business. Issues regarding the performance of city employees constitute matters that must be discussed only in executive session and are not appropriate during the public portion uh, of the meeting. Public comment opportunities during meetings are for comments only. Please do not direct any questions to myself, council, or staff, and please do not approach the dais. Also, please do not approach the clerk at the front of the room or any other staff here that sits up front um, as this disrupts the meeting and it disrupts uh, their ability to do their work. You may inquire if you have questions. You may inquire of staff that are located at the back table back there, and they can provide assistance to you as needed. Unless otherwise provided, each speaker will be allowed three minutes. When it is your turn to speak, please state your name and whether or not you reside in city limits. Madam Clerk, has anyone signed up to speak during the public forum? Yes, Mr. Mayor. Pam Duquette. Hi, Pam Duquette. I do live in the city. Um, I'm here today to speak for the trees. I have planted trees for at least 15 years of my life, living here, supporting my family. I have a passion for trees. I have written letters to the editor in the past about development in the city and the county that has totally denuded areas of trees. And I've wanted to come before 
and see if maybe there's some way developers have to be held to a certain standard of trees left before they begin a development. I have researched and I know other cities do this throughout the country because trees are important. Um, after tree planting, I became a teacher, so I taught about trees. I don't mean that you don't know anything about trees. However, um, trees give us oxygen. They provide shade and with rising temperatures, it's pretty important, they're cooling. Um, they offer mental health benefits. I know when I was going to school and had to write papers, Walking Through the Woods helped me edit my papers. They've actually done studies. Um, they sequester carbon dioxide. One mature tree in one year can um, sequester 48 pounds of carbon dioxide, which is something that is ruining the environment. Um, and that's released when they're cut down. Kids play on them, forts, climbing, swings, they actually filter um, water when it rains and the leaves on the trees, which I didn't realize, remove particulate matter in the air. Um, so I think more value needs to be placed on trees than is being considered in the city and the community. And I guess that brings up the Travers Park development, which spurred me to come in at this point. I hear that there's a lot, about 10 trees out there that are going to be cut. Um, a, a 50 foot tall, a red oak, I mean, some maples. If that's true, I, I would just hope that we're taking into consideration um, how important trees are, more important than placement of a building, I feel. I know those trees have been there for a long time. I think maybe the city had them planted. Um, perhaps the city has been taking care of them. I would just like to see more value placed on trees so that we continue to have a lovely place to live. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Duquette, for those comments. Kyle Schreiber. Kyle Schreiber, same point resident. First, I just wanna thank you all for continuing to hear my thoughts on issues. Uh, today, I wanted to talk about the concept of complete streets. Uh, given my previous comments, you might can uh, guess that I'm a pretty big component uh, proponent of complete streets, but I'm not, and I want to tell you why. Uh, don't get me wrong, I totally agree with the underlying premise that we should be thinking about more than just cars when we're doing our transportation planning. Uh, the problem is that it places pedestrian infrastructure as an embellishment to roads instead of uh, a transportation network independent of roads and often not compatible with them. Our current model puts uh, the onus on homeowners and developers to build sidewalks where they aren't necessarily useful. And that has created an unusable patchwork instead of a viable transportation option. Uh, the goal should not be that every road must have sidewalks and bike lanes on both sides. Oak Street from 5th to 6th is a perfect ex example of what not to do. Uh, it would have been a much better use of our budget to create a single multi-use path for four blocks than four paths on a single block that don't connect to anything. But it does seem like we're headed in the right direction. The sidewalk on Pine Street is a great example. Uh, you know, it's consistent and continuous through its entire length. It uh, connects to other pedestrian infrastructure on both ends, and it uh, goes to and from common destinations. The only problem is that we put it along one of the busiest roads. You know, each street only has so much right of way, and we need to be strategic about how we use it. Pine Street already had competing uses through traffic, parking, snow management. Um, rather than adding another competing use, we could have located that sidewalk one block north on Church Street, made it into a, a full width multi-use path capable of being plowed by an ATV or a pickup truck. Uh, it would have meant Pine would have had more room for parking, uh, snow storage, wider lanes, and it would have meant that pedestrians would have had a safer place to walk uh, on a less busy road. Plus the traffic calming effect of narrowing Church just a little bit would encourage cars to use Pine Street instead. And that's just one example. I don't want to dwell on it. Um, you know, I see it as a learning opportunity. Instead of waiting until pedestrian interactions are so harrowing that we have no other option but to add a sidewalk to a right-of-way that's already in high demand, 
let's be proactive in designing and building out our pedestrian priority network in a way that optimizes both car traffic and pedestrian traffic, often by separating the two. So I wanna urge this council to revive the pedestrian and bicycle committee, and let's get to work building strategic pedestrian thoroughfares that truly offer you, walking and biking as a feasible option. Appreciate your time, always thoughtful comments. Madam Clerk. Janine Shepard. Hi, Janine Shepard, Bonner County. Just here to pray for you guys tonight for your meeting. So I would love it if you would join me in praying. Lord, we lift up this meeting to you and ask that your guiding hand be upon it. We know at times our goals are not the same as yours, and we pray that our will would align with yours in all things. We lift up each item on the agenda and ask that you give the mayor and counselors supernatural wisdom to see things from your point of view. Help us all to set aside our differences and come together under your great hand. Let the decisions made glorify you and help bring heaven to earth right now. We also pray for the businesses of Sandpoint, asking you to help them to prosper even in slow months, that people would see your glory through the way that businesses are run and people are treated here in Sandpoint. We pray that people will know that this city belongs to you as they spend time here. We push back the evil and hate from our community and we command Satan to leave in Jesus' name. Our city is a city of the Lord. We pray your spirit rests upon every inch of this land that we call home. We want to take a moment to pray for those who have experienced tragedy in our county, whether by fire, car accident, or train. Lord, let us be a community that comes alongside of each other, showing your care and concern for our neighbors. Bless them, Lord, and surround them with your comfort. We thank you for the beautiful place we get to live in and ask that your blessing be upon it and upon this meeting. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank and you. Thank you, Ms. Shepherd. Appreciate that. Ruth, uh, Ruth Wimberly. Hello, my name is Ruth Wimberly, and I'm here on behalf of the Browner County Historical Society and Museum. I am here because we are requesting city assistance for a sewer line and a lease, and we are requesting that these items be placed on the agenda for the next city council meeting. Our situation is this. As you know, we own the building at Lakeview Park, but we lease a property from the city. Our lease expired four years ago, and we've been advised um, that we're on a month-to-month -month lease. A new sewer line for us is going to cost over $17,000. This is more than half of our endowment fund. In addition, we need to do fundraising for structural repairs to the building. It's a 50-year-old building. Our concern is that putting all these repairs into the building, a sewer line, when we're on a month to month lease and the expired lease states that on the expiration of the lease, the city takes our building and our improvements without any compensation to us. And that's what I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wimberly. Appreciate that. Rebecca Holland. Uh, good evening, Council. Rebecca Holland. Um, I just want to mention my friend Pam, who came down. I appreciate her comments on the value of trees um, in our community. To see these 10 trees that are slated to be killed, cut down, is just, um, there's just no good thing to say about it. Um, one of the things Pam did mention to me is that she has requested to be part of the tree committee and has never gotten a response back from her letter. And I think that's something that um, you should be looking at. You, just as much as what Kyle was mentioning about the biped committee, um, these are valuable committees and they have been just left by the wayside. Um, I want to mention that over, um, I've been doing some research and I know that there is a um, 
Urban Forestry Management Plan, UFMP, that the city engaged in with a $15,000 uh, grant from the Department of Lands. This was a 2020 grant and in November of 2022 adopted. And in the intro, it says this, as a strategic and forward-looking document, this plan should be incorporated into existing pol policies and requirements of city comp plan, city tree ordinance, Sandpoint stormwater management program, parks, recreation, and open space master plan, and other master plans and agreements with other government agencies, homeowner associations, and local education um, institutes. Further on page 10, it, the goal of this UFMP is to rely, um, the city will partner uh, with or engage in the following and mention a number of items, in particular, preserve and protect existing trees. There's these trees at Travers that the city has nurtured and paid for, the people have paid for, for what, 30 years? There's there you and you can go into this document and look at when they talk about the value, et cetera, et cetera, of these trees. There's you can't put a number on it. We know that this building could go, this great donation could go on a place where there's no trees that you're taking down. And we know that the splash pad could be put next to the existing playground and add some of the um, uh, features the all-inclusive features, that would be wonderful. All of these things are good, but the location, the location, location, location has, been, has not been something that has gone to the community. And it's now is the time to do something. Please save these trees. This is like at a time when we've got global warming and issues like we are right now, breaking records. Hello, it should be just a big knock on the head to everybody to pay attention. And this is something the city can do. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Helen. Appreciate that. One moment, Mr. Mayor. Let me check Zoom. That is all who wish to speak uh, during public forum, Mr. Mayor. All right. Thank you for those thoughtful comments, members of the public. That concludes the public forum portion of the meeting this evening. We'll now proceed with the consent calendar. For the record, the total amount of bills is $1,141,795.36, reflecting $312,648.80 for regular payables and $829,146.56 for payroll. Does council have any questions or are there any items council wishes to remove from the consent calendar? Seeing none, I would entertain a motion the consent calendar be approved. So moved. Second. Been moved and seconded. This will be a roll call vote. Councillor Walker? Yes. Councillor McAllister? Yes. Councillor Spro? Yes. Councillor Rule? Yes. Councillor Dick? Yes. Motion passes. Consent calendar is approved. Next on the agenda is a public hearing on a request for an amendment to the Culver's Crossing Planned Unit Development Agreement. City application number PPUD 21 0002. A notice of public hearing was published in the Bonner County Daily Bee, the city's newspaper of record, on June 27, 2023. I'll now recite the order and procedure for the public hearing. First, explanation of the subject of the public hearing by city staff. Second, applicant's presentation or any statement the applicant would like to make. Please note that the council members should address their questions to the applicant at that time. Third is the opening of the public hearing at which time the public may provide testimony. The order for those providing testimony will be as follows. Those who are in favor of the application will speak first, those who are neutral will speak second, and those who are opposed to the application will speak third. Next, the fourth uh, order of business is the applicant's rebuttal testimony, at which time final questions may be asked of the applicant. Please note, if new facts are elicited during rebuttal, the public will be given an opportunity to comment on any facts. Fifth, we'll, we will close the public hearing. And sixth, the council will deliberate. And again, no new information may be provided after the hearing has been closed, with questions directed only to city staff during deliberation. For the record, any written comments received in time were included in the meeting packet or otherwise provided to council. Before we proceed, I'd like to ask for confirmation from each council member 
that you've had no ex parte contact and that you've had no and that you have no conflict of interest as pertains to this request. No, I have not. Okay. None. 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 Okay, and I have none myself. Uh, before we proceed, um, I'd like to ask for confirmation from each. Uh, I'm sorry. I'd like to yield the floor now to city admin. <laughs> City Planner Amy Tweeton, who will uh, walk us through an introduction and explanation of this request. Thank you, Amy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, again, this public hearing on a requested amendment to the development agreement for Culver's Crossing. Uh, the Culver's Crossing plan unit development, final development plan, and preliminary plat uh, for the 47 lot residential development was approved by City Council. July 6th of last year, and the approval of the development agreement followed on July 20th. Uh, included with that development agreement was Exhibit E, which were the zoning requirements for the planned unit development. And this is the illustration of the final development plan. Uh, the final plat then came forward in uh, November of 2022, um, and one of the changes from for the plat was that the uh, required common open space, rather than being an easement on the lots, um, highlighted in blue along the east side of the um, subdivision, um, it became its own lot. So that um, adjusted some of the lot areas and lot coverage of those lots that was not then transferred back to exhibit E. Um, so when the first building permits were submitted, um, looking at uh, the requirements in specific um, of exhibit E, the, the one standard that um, the table did not adequately uh, represent by the drawings was exhibit E um, and that the percent of windows and doors on building facades that are on street facing facades. Um, and then further review of the overall table, which has a lot of information, indicated that there were some other minor tweaks required uh, based on the final plat. So the request before City Council is to amend that Exhibit E to the development agreement in four general areas, uh, percent of windows and doors on street facing facades, lot sizes to correspond with the approved final plat, and an increase in the percent of impervious area that goes with that, and completion of um, the table that was related to location of garages. Um, in, as a summary on three of those, um, the percent of window and door coverage on street facing facades in the RS zoning district, which is what this is in, requires a minimum of 15% on street facing facade. The current allowance um, is 15, between 15% 15 and 44%. Um, and the proposed allowance would be 9% to 23%. Again, and that's just the street facing facades. Uh, the, the other standard uh, that are some requested modifications uh, in the RS district, the maximum footprint on a lot is 35%. The current agreement allows 24 to 45% of the building to cover the lot. And the request is 28 to 45%. And then total impervious area, which means your building footprint and any other drive areas. Uh, the standard for the zoning district is 65%. The current agreement is 32 to 62%. And the proposed is 38 to 71%. Um, there's two lots that would exceed that 65%. Just an illustration of um, the proposed window to door coverage and what that what we're looking at. Um, so this is one of the four plexes. And if you notice in the upper right corner where this uh, would be located would be at the corner of Irvine Drive 
And um, I believe this one is Peridot. So it's one of those long fourplexes. So this is the facade that would face the purely local drive, which is Peridot or Onyx. Uh, this is Onyx Core, sorry. Um, so that's the long facade, and that is showing a 13% uh, window and door coverage. And then the same lot facing um, Irvine Drive, which is the shorter end of the building, um, is showing a 9%. And just another illustration of the triplex units. So these are the, the attached three units. Um, the location in the upper right is where those are located. Again, the, the fronts of those are facing purely local drives. And that is um, on the Irvine Drive is 9%. And then on the interior, on the purely local drives, um, Peridot and Onyx Court along the long side of that is a 12 to 13% window and door coverage. Again, um, the requested amendment uh, is shown in the table um, is less, uh, is lower on the window door coverage, um, slightly greater at the low end on the building footprints and uh, greater on the total impervious area. Nice, uh, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, that's a quick clarifying question on that last slide, Amy. The maximum building footprint percentage of lot area, it's 45% under the current development agreement and the proposed development agreement. What, what's the minimum there? Why are we specifying a minimum if the code only cares about the maximum? It looks like this the, the minimum is going to increase slightly, but that's not a concern of all. Right, it's just the range that they're showing as an adjustment. Okay, so there's no change to the maximum building footprint from the original development agreement under the proposed amendment. At the high end, you're right. Okay, yeah. understood. Okay. So the low end would, would be the result of shrinking, eliminating the easement and separating out the common area lot for those Eastern units, is that correct? Right. Okay, so it's really not affecting this element of, of the agreement because this determines maximum allowable. You're right. Okay. So again, the requested action is the approval of the proposed resolution that would authorize the mayor to sign the amended memorandum of agreement that would incorporate the requested changes only to exhibit E with the remainder of the agreement saying the same. Thank you, Amy. Appreciate that presentation. Um, I do want to correct the record. I did have ex parte contact with the project manager of this project prior to this amendment application. Um, however, I, I feel that um, I can confidently uh, uh, make an unbiased decision if called to do so in this in this case. Um, are there any questions for Amy? No? Okay. Next, the applicant uh, is free to come forward and make any statement or presentation that you care to. Yes, I do. Thank you. I'm Nancy Hadley. Um, I am the applicant, and I wanted to apologize for not having a correct spreadsheet. Um, this has been quite a complex project and um, many, many moving pieces, and I love spreadsheets. And my main goal was looking at the financial spreadsheet. And um, when we looked at the development standard spreadsheet, I paid a lot of attention to setbacks. I didn't pay attention once the common area was given away. So um, when the issue came up, I really appreciated staff and their support explanations. And I sat down and now own the development spreadsheet as well as the whole development team does as well. We spent a lot of time reviewing, re-reviewing, making sure that we had everything right, you know, realizing that, you know, with all that common area, there were some setbacks that changed. Um, and then on the buildings, 
you know, what would it take to comply with the percentage of windows? And it was like enlarging a master bedroom window, which would then throw off the engineering and the beams and the expenses and a master, a larger master bedroom that would be oversized really would not create anything that would add value to the people that were, were living there. And so I really am asking, you know, the buildings haven't changed, the footprints are in the planned unit development. Um, the buildings um, are going to be beautiful when they're built. They're my um, contractor that's building some now, they're very complex. They have a lot of different planes, I think Amy mentioned. And so we, and we are trying to create um, with the planned unit development, you know, uh, we need a little bit of variance to be able to try to create some homes. Um, I'm not sure if the prices are coming in at are affordable for Sandpoint, Idaho, but they're certainly cheaper than anything that's on the market right now. And um, I'm hoping going forward that, you know, this project is going to be um, something that that the community will appreciate and it will provide some great homes to some of our locals and people. Thank you, Ms. Hadley. Appreciate that. Does council have any questions for the applicant? Sure, Mr. Mayor. Hi, Nancy. Thank you. And, and thank you for your transparency with this um, in terms of bringing it here and where we found out about it and where we're at right now. A couple of questions on the on the development here. Are we still, I guess we spoke almost, uh, what, a little over a year ago um, when you guys were here at council chambers. Are we still looking at the same type of proposed project in terms of affordable housing? I think that we were looking at 60% were under current market value, or at least that's where you're trying to shoot for. Uh, market value has um, been volatile. And I think as we're looking at when we were visiting, you know, we were in a three to 4% interest rate environment. Now we're in a six to 7% interest rate environment. And that really has um, taken it out of affordable for a lot of people. Um, I am working with Bonner Community Housing Agency. Uh, there is a USDA product that will, um, and the, the, my, this is approximate, approximately loan 419,000 with no down payment at 4% interest. And so I am willing to decrease the price of some of my units to hit that 419 if we have people qualify. So that is my goal. I am building two triplexes with uh, Idaho Housing and Finance, and those will be at a reduced rent. So it would be, as an example, median income, um, you take 80% of that is $60,000, 30% of that is $1,500 a month, what people can afford, and then we give them a utility allowance. So I will have six rentals out there um, with the help of Idaho, my Idaho Housing Award. And um, so, yes, I am. Um, that is my goal. Um, and uh, the Idaho Housing, what was it? Is that is that a state run agency Idaho housing and finance yes and it was a workhorse workforce housing award i think that there was some uh, federal money that that came in we applied and uh won the award so for both both state and federal yeah that if i, I can just step yeah. in for a second the ihfa is a state agency but it's uh it's a it's essentially the state arm of hud so gotcha. federal federal funds, federal programs throw, flow through IHFA. Okay. And then um, did you guys ever have the lottery uh, for those that fit the criteria and did the classes, um, you know, Sandpoint, work in Sandpoint, majority uh, moneymaker in the household? Uh, that is a very good question. Everybody fell off the list when interest rates went up. I have no waiting list. There's nobody knocking the door down to buy those. So I have a $2 million investment and I've sold one lot. And how far along is the project right now? You guys foundations, uh, how much dirt We're is We're putting foundations in for the two triplex buildings that will be rentals. I have um, another, I sold one lot and I do believe they're going to be uh, building a single family home. I'm not sure when they're going to start that. Um, I'm certainly getting interest out there. Um, I've got my 
contractor that did the roads has now gone in and completed most of the sidewalks. There was a little bit of delay on Boyer to keep the trees. Oh, they left. <laughs> um, we had to move the sidewalk around the trees. Um, and, and so we had to get approval for that. That has happened. So I do anticipate that all of the improvements for the subdivision will be done. And then it's just a matter of marketing. And then again, with low to no sales and my money's tied up into the subdivision, I really don't have the money to go in and build any more buildings because I am building the Idaho housing and providing some of my own funds for that. And so it's just a matter of when interest rates come down, I'm thinking in two or three years, the market might settle down. I think I've lived here my whole life and I certainly have seen the real estate market do this. I, I work in finance. I see stocks and bonds do that. And so, you know, really it's just a matter of me cash flowing the project, um, keeping everything up, and then just creating opportunities and keep looking for opportunities. And my development team is behind me as well. Um, so I'm just going to keep plugging along and now I will keep working <laughs> forever. <laughs> now, did you guys have a ruin going back to the last council meeting? Um, Rob was up here. Uh, Mr. Hart was up here from Bonner County Housing Authority or agency, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, in, in kind of, I guess, quote unquote, said he was already facing the headwind of double interest and inflation greater than we've seen in 40 years was there was there an anticipation that that might happen that might reduce the affordability of the sixty percent of the houses that would would go to our citizens through the lottery and the criteria that had to be met? And and the lottery was really based on having so many people that were interested in the projects. Mm -hmm. um, and so as as we faced inflation, the cost of building in Sandpoint, and inflation also affects wages, which go up. But, um, you know, right now it's, it's not only, you know, my housing, but, you know, the, the real estate sales have dropped significantly. Um, costs have gone up, gone up a little bit. They've started to come down this year. Um, I really anticipate by next year, interest rates will be back. The affordability of housing normally is what a person can afford to make a payment on. You know, it used to be that people were able to go ahead and buy homes and pay for them. We certainly don't see that very much anymore. So, you know, if we go from a 7% interest rate, which is current or higher, back down to a 4% interest rate, and then if we can keep the, the price of the building materials, right now we did see lumber come down, which was, was very good. So that price came down, but all of the subcontractors are still extremely busy. And so their prices are at a premium. And so it really is supply and demand. Um, I would love to have a waiting list and people in line and being able to run a lottery. Um, I'd be able to love to be able to sell in the 350 range but um, I can't afford to sell buildings at a loss. Mm. I can't afford to build them. Um, and so, you know, I'm, I'm willing to discount the land um, up to what I can afford, but I do have to have a return of my principal and a little bit of return on my principal. So mm. for my- And then how, how much money were you awarded through the state and the federal dollars uh, on the affordable housing side? So it is actually just a loan. Okay. So Idaho housing- loaned me 1.5 million. Mm -hmm. I put in the land with all the infrastructure and then I had to put in 300,000 roughly okay. of my own money. Good deal, so. thank you. <clears throat> okay. Any other questions? Ms. Mayor, I, yeah. Nancy, thank you for your transparency because in reading the packet, the one, the two words that uh, really stood out to me on number three was entirely incorrect. And so I'm glad you explained that because I thought, well, entirely incorrect. How did that happen? Um, so thank you for your explanation. Also, were were those rentals planned? I guess I thought that they were all going to be houses that were sold. So I I'm so surprised that the rental intention um, going way back is I actually I sold two duplexes or four rentals that I owned previously and put that money into this project. And I have three rentals on the project. I tore two of them down. So my intention has always been to have eight to 10 rentals as part of my retirement plan in the project, but that certainly left lots of other lots for single family. 
So part of it is part of, you know, my rentals um, because I have a 40 year loan now with Idaho housing. And that as long as I have that loan, I will be offering affordable housing. Someone said, wow, your kids are lucky <laughs> because that's more legacy. Um, but um, it just seemed the right thing to do. And the, the award or the program actually came up towards the end of the plat process or, or maybe um, just like in the January timeframe, December, January timeframe of last year, where we had already been approved in July. So in July, we were not looking. It's just to kind of see what is happening and what opportunities are there. And that, that particular program seemed to fit our project. And so I was able to uh, apply and get the award, which was a pretty big deal so to me anyway. Thank you. Yeah. And yeah, I have no idea that column, um, what happened, but I did not own that spreadsheet. I looked at some of the square footages and um, I apologize for that. I mean, it's, it's my responsibility. And I was so focused on the financial spreadsheet and making sure I didn't run out of money before the end of the project that, you know, I, I didn't go through in extreme detail and look at everything else. So thank you. Mr. Mayor. Yeah. Quick question. I'm a little, uh, can, you, can you clarify a little bit? You're looking to sell single family lots in the Culver's Crossing development. I have five single family lots. Oh, just five single family lots. Yep. But the remainder of that, what were the 49 units total? Well, or, there's the common lot. Right. But as far as dwelling, dwelling units, common lot is it... one. so when you look at that, they're really single family attached. So the quad building has one inch of airspace in between each unit. Mm -hmm. So we will sell them a lot. So if you look at the plat, it's very, very busy. So they get a front yard, backyard. They own the land that that's on. There's a one inch separation. So I have quad buildings, triplexes, and twin homes or but, two homes. But you won't be building those. You're looking you to know, sell those. You know, I would those. love to if I could um, get out from underneath some of the debt that I'm in now then I could afford to go ahead and build some of those and be able to sell them. And then the other thing that happened, and of course, this is like a two-year process um, to get to where we were last, last year, you know, as we were planning all of this, um, I had been meeting with the banks for five years, giving them an explanation of where I was, updating my financial statement, um, talking to them about commercial lending, and last July, as we were getting approval, the bank said, sorry, we're not doing any commercial lending. So they backed out completely. And that is just like, wow. So I've been doing this with no um, bank lending. And, and, you know, and then interest rates went from 5% commercial up to 10%. So, you know, you just can't predict as you're developing, it seems like, wow, you know, She's got this big project and it's like, and the expenses that go along with that. And I think you guys probably have seen some development stop. You know, I know the one that Ramey Construction, I haven't seen anything going on there. I haven't seen sidewalks go in north of my property. You know, money is tight right now. Sales are low. So, you know, it, it just is, it's not a matter of what's happening today. I've figured it out. I can cash flow um, my, my loans and leverage. But it's like it might be three to four years before things turn around and they start to cycle again. So I would I would like to just kind of applaud you for moving forward and taking the risk on yourself to get some some, you know, some buildings up off the ground, because I do notice, of course, the <laughs> nearly every one of the 900 multifamily units that were promised is have ground to a halt in the last year. And it's it's encouraging to see some dirt getting moved in Clover's Crossing. Yeah. Um, and I, I would, you know, thank you. And then, you know, encourage you to keep moving forward because when that market does turn around, you'll have those units already built. Yeah. You'll, you'll have, you know, that you'll be the first yeah. to sell then. And, and then what I'm looking at too is with the twin homes, um, if I can can find people that qualify for the USDA funding, I think it's like income of about 70000 to be able to afford a $419,000 home. Um, it should be fairly easy to get two people, sell those, you know, I can then get a construction loan. I'll discount the, again, the value of the land to be able to sell them at that because I think right now I haven't priced it for twenty five to four fifty. dollars But, you know, again, I'm, I'm trying to create activity out there and opportunity and um, you know, getting 
um, you know, people homes that that are are looking for them. So, and again, thank you for getting me in before the budget. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I know that's a challenging discussion, and please accept my apologies for the errors that were on that. No worries, uh, Council. Any other questions? Thank you, Ms. Hadley. Appreciate that. Thank you. Okay, we will now move on to the public hearing. Just a reminder that the public hearing is for comments only. Do not address any questions to council or myself or to city staff. If council members have questions for the person testifying, they should ask those questions at the time of their testimony. For those participating on Zoom, you will need a working microphone on your phone or computer to speak. If you wish to speak in favor or neutral or opposed, I will call for testimony on each and you'll raise your hand on Zoom at that time. When your name is called, you'll see a prompt on your screen screen asking whether you would like to unmute, then you will need to unmute yourself in order to be heard. As a reminder, those here in chambers who wish who'd like to speak, you will need to complete a comment form at the front uh, table by the door. And please uh, complete that sign up form and hand it to uh, any city staff at the rear table there. Please state your name uh, on the form and whether you wish to speak whether whether you wish to speak in favor or neutral or opposed to the request to the application you will see those options on the form and please do not approach the dais if you have any written materials for council please hand those to city staff at the back table our city policy provides that the presiding officer may allow time to be gifted during a public hearing i will allow this option this evening for those present here in the room if you wish to gift your three minutes to another speaker who is also present in the room you may do so. You may only do this once and the maximum amount of time a single speaker will be allowed for testimony is six minutes. If, you're give, if you are gifted time, please state who has gifted you time when you approach the dais. Please note that you both must have completed and submitted a sign-up form. Madam Clerk, has anyone signed up to testify in favor of the applicant? No, Mr. Mayor. Okay. Has anyone signed up to testify who is neutral to the application? Yes, Mr. Mayor. Okay. Kyle Schreiber. I've decided not. Okay. okay. No other who are neutral, Mr. Mayor. Okay. And is there anyone who has signed up to speak who is opposed to the application? Yes, Mr. Mayor. Okay. Ariel Jordan Luther. Hi, I'm Ariel Luther. I have been here since 98. So I was four years old when I got here. I have lived on, off Ebbett Way, which is just around from the Culver's Crossing. I now own 1618 Culver's Drive, which means I am the largest lot that has to do with, the, with what's going up. So I thought this project was to benefit the locals who've been here the longest. And it doesn't seem like it's doing that. In my opinion, I've lived there. I signed on my house October 21st of 2022, knowing that the, it was going in and understanding that there would be a lot of construction, but supportive because that meant people that I grew up with would have homes. And I am, while I live there, there's been no respect for my property. I have dump trucks that drive through the side of my yard. I have debris. I come home to dirt being shoved into my yard. So it's hard to be supportive on this project, if that makes sense. So I'm just wondering how how it's going to benefit the community or me being the neighbors or my neighbors that are next to me have been there as long as I have. And it's just, it's not looking like a locals project. And being right there, I want to be supportive of my neighbors. I want to be a good neighbor to them. But so far, having them just loaded in like sardines in a can isn't looking beneficial for the neighborhood. And then this new issue with Boyer that you addressed earlier with the traffic, I've been stuck before the roundabout at Larch now. And that's the issue that we're gonna have later on when all these buildings go in, where will the traffic go? That like, where is it gonna come out of the train? There's two trains, there's already so much traffic that stops right there. And then, okay, train goes, we're gonna have how many 400 new people living along there? Where will they go? Is there a plan 
to get us where we need to go. Cause right now I have to go, if I want to go to Ponder, I have to go out and over, but I'm, I'm stuck. But what happens when there's more families, husbands, wives, two cars per home, what will happen for there? Will it be good for the community or will it not be good for the community? So that's my question. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Luther, for those comments. Madam Clerk. Barry Smith. Mr. Mayor, no one else has signed up to speak. Okay. So uh, just to be clear, uh, there's no one else who would like to speak either here or on Zoom. Is that correct? Mr. Mayor, that is correct. Okay. Um, does council have any other uh, additional questions? Okay, hearing none. Uh, before the public hearing is closed, would the applicant care to offer any rebuttal testimony? Uh, just a reminder that if any new facts are elicited during rebuttal, the public must be given the opportunity to comment on. So uh, do you care to rebut? You're good? Okay. The public hearing is now closed. So no new information may be provided and questions may be directed only to city staff during deliberation. I would entertain a motion to approve the resolution amending the Culver's Crossing PUD Master Development Agreement. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. Been moved and seconded. Is there any uh, discussion? Yeah, I, if, Mr. Mayor, if you don't mind. Um, this one was really challenging for me. Um, I think the applicant and their legal staff are very, very well intentioned with this project. Um, what makes me really nervous is I got caught up in the affordable side of this, um, and I probably should have known better. And I had employees that were signed up and taken the classes. Uh, knowing that state and federal dollars, whether it was given or whether it was a loan, um, I, I get very nervous after dealing with some of this prior outside of council that we see quite the affordable housing grift in the state of Idaho uh, and across the nation right now. And developers, not all developers, and I, I certainly don't think uh, Ms. Hadley or her staff are this type of per person or developer, but they will find ways to circumvent the affordable housing rules to get money, to get the public excited about it, to go out there with that project and never complete said project. And those particular lots or housing uh, all gets turned into market price. I was very happy to hear um, Mrs. Hadley talk about where they would be price wise. It still seems like they'd be very low considering what we have in our market place right now. Um, we would add much needed inventory to Sandpoint uh, as we get forward. I'm hoping very, very much that if the interest rates do come down, that we get back to this local criteria and lottery. Um, but, but this does worry me as kind of a textbook case of if I was a developer and I was looking for the loopholes, uh, this would be a case study in terms of how I might do it, not saying that you or your council or any of your staff might be in there. So I just want to caution our, our council. Uh, when we hear this, we've heard a lot of affordability. We've talked about not a lot of dirt moving for developers and contractors and consultants that have come before us and told us a very similar story. Uh, and we have not seen a single thing move. We haven't seen any dirt move uh, moving forward. So again, I think I'm more inclined to approve this moving forward, again, because of the transparency of the applicant. What we've already seen, we're not making any massive changes to anything that we haven't seen prior uh, from a year ago. Um, but I would love if we could get this thing back to where it was a year ago in terms of adding more affordable housing to our locals and our local workforce. <clears throat> Thank you. Mr. Mayor. Yeah. Um, there's been concerns uh, about debris going into other people's property. Is that something really the city can do anything about? The answer is yes. You don't mind. You're the one with the gunman. You can do what you want. <laughs> 
speak into the microphone. No, the, the answer is yes. So in these projects, if there's somebody that's putting debris on other project, so what I would encourage them to do is call the police department, speak with our community resource officers. They'll go out, they'll evaluate it. And if they determine there's something happening, they'll take care of it. Okay. So yeah. Thank you. Council, any other comments? Well, I, I would just, if you don't mind, just to, my thoughts in response, we're deliberating here. So in my thoughts in response to Justin's comment, um, I, I, I share his frustration with the stalling of projects all over town. Um, honestly, I, when I saw this on the agenda tonight, it was almost a relief that at least one of these projects I know is, is moving forward at some pace. Um, the, the, the macro environment is so different than it was a year ago. I mean, who would have thought that the housing market could slow down in this country, but it's like we've never seen it before. I mean, it, it's kind of predictable this is going to happen. It was chaotic for the last three years. Um, it has happened more abruptly than I think we any of us would have hoped. And the need is still there. So just the, the fact that there that Miss um, Hadley is 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 has a sincere interest in moving this project forward in a way that doesn't lose her money, I think is is um, applaudable. So I again, I'd reiterate my appreciation for that. Um, and while we have, you know, multifamily development on the agenda tonight, I I would love perhaps a pipeline update from our city planner at the next meeting or an upcoming meeting. I think it's been around six months since we've heard um, any update on the development pipeline. So I'm, I'm interested in the other hundreds of multifamily units that were that seem to have ground to a halt this year. Um, but again, Justin, I, I totally agree um, in this case that the, the original Culver's Crossing vision was for, uh, in, in my understanding, was for um, a percentage of the units to be available for uh, the, the demand that existed <laughs> two years ago, a year ago for that workforce housing. Um, the very fact that the waiting list has dried up and is no longer there shows how the market has changed. Um, but again, a market priced house is still subject to the market and the market itself is slowing down. Therefore, affordability for the house prices themselves has already come back to something more reasonable and realistic for standpoint. Not to say that you know a $500,000 home is any more affordable than a $750,000 home, but that's kind of the direction we've gone in the last year. Um, inflation just fell below 4% for the first time in over a year. So, you know, the forecast is for lower interest rates in the future. And again, being ahead of the curve, it seems like Culver's Crossing is a little bit ahead of the curve compared to other multifamily developments. And I think that could be a really good thing for Nancy and her partners. Um, cause this in, in the long run, housing and Sandpoint is a good bet. So investing in it now can't hurt in the long run. She talks about generational, you know, something for her kids, uh, so keep moving forward. Thank you. Um, but to Amy, just a, you know, a little update for us in the future. I, I know I hear it from the community. All time. Jason, what's going on with that development out on Highway 2 or that development up on Boyer? I'm like, I don't know. Well, aren't you on city council? So it would be nice to have a little update if you know some of the status of some of those developments at a future meeting. So thank Mr. you. Mr. Mayor, yeah. and my concern is the drying up of the of people are leaving. They don't have any place to live. And so you know, I hear that all the time, too, about the housing, and um, I was driving on Highway 2 and wondered what is happening with with those, because you see starts everywhere, and I'm just concerned about, you know, the workforce and the low-wage earners, and where are they going to go? I mean, I just, I, I, I don't, it seems like everything just stopped. As much as people leaving, though, the increase in interest rates from three and a half to seven percent, right. that almost doubles a monthly payment, so the, the demand for rentals is stronger than ever. Right, but where are they? They aren't, yeah, that's the problem. <laughs> so we're, we're the, 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 the workforce housing question, workforce housing was always about making housing affordable for somebody to buy, Sure. right? right. But we were promised 800 rental units coming down the pipeline. Yes. If people can't afford to buy now, that's gonna exacerbate the problem on the rental end. Right. So that that's as much of a concern to me as, you know, whether uh, uh, an employee of Justin's can afford a $415,000 home. They're probably not going to be able to do that anyway, but a no. rent, a, a $1,500 a month rental. Mm -hmm. That's what we need right now. Yeah. And where are they? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Any other comments? Council? We have a motion and a second on the table. This will be roll call vote. Councillor Dick? Yes. Councillor Rule? Yes. Councillor McAllister? Yes. Councillor Sparrow? Yes. Councillor Walker? Yes. 
Okay, the resolution amendment uh, is approved. No agreement, congratulations. The next item is a presentation review of the city's proposed fiscal year 2024 budget, followed by an adoption of the preliminary budget. Council will also consider declaring attention to use foregone levying authority. To both use and reserve foregone amounts in the annual budget, public hearing will be scheduled. Will be scheduled. I now yield the floor to City Administrator Jennifer Stapleton. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And once again, I have our uh, City Finance Director, Treasurer, uh, Sarah Lins with me. And honestly, in putting together the budget, it's Sarah that does the bulk of the work and it's me at the kind of giving the guidance of what's in, what's out. And, um, where we need to cut to stay in uh, compliance with our strategic plan adopted by council. And so I kind of have the final end of the piece and Sarah starts this process uh, February of each year. So um, she also has more details and um, can assist with answering questions. A reminder about what's before council tonight, what you're being asked to do is um, set a adopt a preliminary budget and with the preliminary budget that's our ceiling so it doesn't mean that as we go through budget discussions which will primarily be at our next council meeting that you can't make changes within the budget but you couldn't make changes to exceed the maximum amount um, that you adopt tonight and then finally we're requesting uh, that you schedule a public hearing on august 16th um, where the public has the opportunity to provide input and feedback back to the council on the budget before you make a final decision on the final budget. Inclu included in your council packet was our 2024 proposed uh, expenditure budget worksheet. We kind of have two things that happen with our budget. You're used to seeing our um, spreadsheet and it's kind of a quick cheat sheet for you to compare what we're proposing for the next fiscal year with what we have in the current fiscal year for budget and what our actuals have been uh, in prior years. And we pretty consistently used uh, this spreadsheet over the last um, at least couple decades. So it's carrying that forward. So you have the familiarity with that. Um, but in addition, in the packet, we also provided a link for our online budget book, which uh, this year, we are in transition to a new uh, budget book on a new platform from what we have used in previous years. But for the most part, uh, it should look similar to you um, in terms of what's contained in that budget book and narratives. Uh, our staff narratives are all available in that budget book online, and I am working through meetings with all of the council members individually. Uh, over the next week, and we'll finalize kind of the overall summary of the budget. Um, and uh, we will have the final budget book um, published available. So it's easy public access um, by beginning of August on the front page of our website. Uh, our proposed budget maximum uh, for fiscal year uh, 2024 is uh, $52,974,269, which is an increase of $3,318,735 over fiscal year 2023, which we are currently in. It's a total increase of 6.68%. Um, that increase is, uh, for the most part, attributable to our enterprise funds. Our enterprise funds include our water fund, and our sewer fund. And I think what council will be pleased to see in the budget, the public as well, in accordance with our strategic plan is we budgeted approximately $6 million in fiscal year 2024 to move forward with design and um, phased construction of our wastewater treatment plant. Um, we have had discussions in the past about moving forward with a comprehensive uh, design build of a full plant um, as opposed to a phase project. Uh, however, when we made the decision to build the plant at the existing site, a phased approach probably makes most sense as we're bringing up new components, taking down uh, old components. As a reminder, our wastewater treatment plant, we have significant components of our wastewater treatment plant that are over 60 years old. Um, they uh, came to us from uh, Farragut, and uh, 
this is not a departure from a full rebuild of our wastewater treatment plant. But, um, it would be a phased rebuild of our wastewater treatment plan, which is what is one of our driving factors um, around the decision to this approach is conversations with funding agencies about what's going to be most compatible, most competitive. Um, for the best financing as well as for grant programs and um, a phased approach is going to be most competitive for us moving forward. Uh, Greg is working on identifying our specific work plan um, for this in uh, fiscal year 2024 has already identified components of the plant that we would look at replacing first. And we can certainly have more detailed discussion about that uh, at our uh, our next council meeting in August, where we get into typically capital um, projects discussion, um, most in depth. Um, overall, with this budget, as I mentioned, we're seeing that increase in enterprise uh, fund expenditures, but we are seeing a decrease in general fund expenditures um, by about three quarters of a million dollars from fiscal year 2023 expenditures. Um, there are a number of factors in there, but um, your primary factor in that is um, the uh, we're coming to the end of our one-time expenditure of ARPA funds, and uh, so we've approximately three hundred thousand left in ARPA funds um, of uh, an initial allocation of closer to two million dollars. So we have completed a uh, we're very close to the end of a um, phased remodel of uh, our city hall facility. And so that's primarily why you're seeing that uh, reduction in expenditures. Our phase one, uh, as you will recall, was a remodel of council chambers. And that was adding technology that allowed us to have in-person meetings, electronic meetings, um, uh, particularly during COVID is what kind of drove that and getting so that this was more functional for community members who are in attendance in person they can better hear what's going on in meetings they can better see um, what it is that is being considered during meetings that was phase one phase two was a uh, customer service remodel uh, so first floor of city hall where we consolidate our services to one-stop shopping um, made it an easier experience for the public coming in instead of figuring out our our maze to go through City Hall. They had one place to go to for customer service, created efficiency and cost savings for us at the city and taxpayers as well, as we then created a single reception unit where we could cross train across different functions. We can provide service to more people in City Hall that way, um, as well as cover across uh, service areas for the front desk. And so we don't need as many people providing uh, functions when we can cross train across functions. Um, the uh, phase three remodel of City Hall was completed last year, and that was a police remodel. Um, and uh, police moved back in um, last fall, I think it was about this time. And um, we got the kind of the functionality cleaned up there, security safety issues that we had with access to police facilities. And we moved into um, early this year, this fiscal year, we moved into in late last fiscal year remodel of the second floor of City Hall. Um, that has just been completed. It gave us more office space, better functionality and flow in City Hall. Uh, we have a new larger conference room, which we were much in need of on the second floor that just opened a couple of weeks ago. And um, we are essentially done with all of those upgrades other than um, connection to our new generator, which is sitting out back of City Hall and provides us uh, backup um, power for all of City Hall as, a part, as opposed to uh, just components, um, some areas of police and our uh, server room only so that in the event of um, an emergency, we have a weather issue, we need warming area for elderly uh, community members or community members at risk, we can actually open up 
uh, council chambers uh, and uh, have that functional as well as have all of our city functions functional functional in the event of a power loss. Um, and so we are waiting for the transfer switch um, for that to be fully in place. And we've been waiting for that um, for a year and a half. So some of the supply chain issues and construction have uh, impacted us. Um, earlier in this fiscal year, earlier this spring, council approved a final phase of remodel and that was some improvements in fire department. What kind of drove that was we had a roof leak and flooding over in fire. Um, and we have some much overdue um, improvements that make particularly our living quarters um, and sleeping quarters for firefighters, uh, more functional addresses, privacy address the needs we needed in our restrooms. And that is underway and we should be completed with the fire remodel here about middle of next month. So um, that it gets us done with this building and we're in the process of pods moving out. Uh, so we are, again, almost at the end of our ARPA funding. It will take us through the end of the remodel. Those were identified one-time projects, and you're seeing a reduction in uh, overall general fund budget because of the spend out of the ARPA funding. Uh, proposed budget in terms of operation includes a 2% uh, COLA market increase for our employees effective January First, that's across all of our uh, city groups um, at the city, uh, and that's to keep us in line with our benchmarking. We had significant discussion about employee benchmarking uh, about two council meetings ago, um, and across the board, our expenses across city uh, divisions, uh, what you will see in 2024 is increases due to one-time projects, so that's infrastructure capital projects or uh, you are seeing generally expenses in line with fiscal year 2023 and prior fiscal years. Um, the proposed 24 budget um, uh, is adopted at the maximum amount anticipates levying uh, $4,802,497 in property taxes. In accordance with state law, the maximum allowed property tax is $4,967,418. The difference in that reflects property tax relief that our property taxpayers will have again in 2024 um, that is related to um, collection of uh, resort city tax that was over what was budgeted. So in accordance with state law, that goes back to our property taxpayers as property tax relief. And um, we are beyond having a sales tax or over collection of resort city taxes related to bed taxes. So that's taxes that are on um, hotel rooms and taxes that are on short-term rentals. And so when we collect more than what we budgeted, those go back as property tax relief. Uh, we do in the online budget book, consistent with prior years. Hopefully I can make this seamless. Um, we've got our property tax table. Bear with me just a second. Got to switch screens there for a second. Once again, in our online budget book, we give an analysis of impact on our property taxes in particular. Um, to residents and you will find our table, which you should look familiar to you. Let me switch to the other one real quick. Mm -hmm. And make it easier. A lot easier when we have more than one screen.
which should make it more readable than my editable version. Uh, you'll be familiar that we uh, prepare this uh, property tax summary table every year showing um, our property taxes levied in the current year uh, compared to what is proposed in uh, the next fiscal year. You'll note in this, pro in, this, um, in this sheet currently, we have three areas that are highlighted. Those are construction roll, that's new construction. So that's construction that has happened, come on our tax rolls in the last year. And uh, the reason you're seeing that highlighted is that's our estimate right now. Um, we will get our tax rolls from the county hopefully tomorrow. So uh, the timing of our meeting today <laughs> didn't work the best for having this finalized. Um, and in prior years, we used to, um, a reminder to council members, we would have our construction rolls earlier and they would be the final numbers by the time this came to you. But with um, legislative changes that passed in the last couple of years, it requires that those be more current. So we don't get, it creates the challenge for us where you're getting more current construction roles, but we're not getting them until we're already basically through a essentially completed budget to present to council. Um, we have included in the budget uh, foregone uh, in the amount of $50,000. So this is taxes that we could have levied in a prior year that we didn't. And uh, we've included foregone in the amount of $50,000 specifically for the purchase of equipment uh, in our public safety divisions, primarily over in police. Um, where we're doing uh, replacement of some of our vehicles and have that included in the budget. Um, uh, you again will notice that what we're showing for fiscal year 24 is property tax relief. Again, this year we had property tax relief in fiscal year 2023 uh, and property tax relief again because of over collection of reverse tax is 164000 $921. So essentially our increase in our uh, general fund um, property taxes, 2023 to 2024 is about $70,000, which includes a significant portion of that is new construction rules. Mm -hmm. uh, we do an analysis and you'll see these numbers change a bit down below. Uh, property tax calculation to understand with what we're projecting, what that means bottom line um, for a homeowner. In 2023, we were using median house value combined lot and house of $623,812. We've accounted for at this point about a 1% increase, and you'll see this adjust a little bit before this comes back to you, and we'll talk about it at the next council meeting. Um, we base that adjustment on what we're seeing for overall market change, percent market change, uh, and again, we'll get that when we get property tax rolls tomorrow. Um, but essentially, with the increase of the approximately um, $70,000 for uh, a homeowner with a property tax value of 623974 that would be an annual increase of $21.93. The budget for uh, this fiscal year uh, in alignment with our um, strategic plan contemplates um, significant uh, capital and infrastructure investments. I did mention the wastewater treatment plant, um, but you will also see reflected in this budget is uh, increased expenditures for sidewalk and bike path projects, as well as road reconstruction and maintenance projects. And um, again, the increase is uh, attributable primarily to the increase that was improved by voters of the resort city tax. So that is allowing us to increase our investment in um, road reconstruction, sidewalk projects, bike path projects, and overall maintenance projects. Um, we're anticipating an increase in our road maintenance, street maintenance, and um, reconstruction projects with city dollars 
of um, 300,000, but we've accounted for um, some variance in that, that uh, resort city tax um, may come in higher. So we've included the option for us to expand um, projects uh, uh, up to $200,000 uh, revenue dependent. In terms of capital projects that you will see beginning underway next year, and we've been talking about them for quite some time, the Great Northern Realignment and Reconstruction Project Council this spring uh, approved a, um, a act with, uh, contract with a company to assist us with um, property acquisition, right-of-way acquisition as needed for that project. Um, we budget, budgeted just under $1.5 million to finalize design of the Great Northern Realignment, as well as to support uh, property acquisition that's needed to get construction underway. Um, we are also contemplating in uh, fiscal year 24, um, beginning the design, um, beginning and completing the design for phase three of downtown revitalization. Uh, that is planned to be undertaken as we complete the uh, design downtown waterfront design competition and get all of those um, results in October. So there may be some impacts um, uh, to what we want to do with design on First Avenue. So uh, we've accounted for that in our timeline. Um, as well as we have been budgeted for a project which we discussed, East-West Connection, the short-term project. So that's moving of uh, the um, streetlight from Church Street over to Pine Street and taking that section of uh, street back to two-way um, between First Avenue and uh, Fifth Avenue. And you will have coming before you to get that underway in your next meeting and MOU with ITD for that project. Uh, so we are moving that forward as well. So again, uh, significant investment in capital and uh, infrastructure projects. We have included in the budget uh, $500,000 for set aside for projects and activities for the downtown waterfront, which could mean um, furthering design on Farman's Landing, beginning implementation of construction on Farman's Landing. It could be assisting us with code changes to protect the historic character of downtown. You'll recall with the waterfront design competition, design teams are asked to make recommendations. Uh, with phase three, they will need to come up with associated costs and they'll need to make recommendations to the city on prioritization. Ultimately, the decision on prioritization will be the council, but this gives us a set aside of dollars so that we aren't just doing a competition with no plan to move forward. This is the seed money to move forward with uh, activities under that project. So at this point, um, that's what I have um, for presentation regarding ceiling for the budget, as well as foregone levying authority. Uh, and we'll entertain any questions, Mr. Mayor and Council. Thank you, Jennifer. Appreciate that. Council, questions? All right, that must have been very thorough. Oh, sure. I, Mr. Mayor, uh, Jennifer, you touched a little bit on the wastewater treatment center plan. It's my understanding that um, the staff had worked very diligently on the DEQ ap application, and it sounds like we did not receive that. Could you tell us a little more about that? We were not awarded in this round. We did not score high enough for um, state revolving loan funds. And we knew that that was a possibility and we presented that when we came in and, and sought approval to apply for that funding. Unfortunately, the challenge that we have as we are applying for dollars is um, that those that are scored the highest tend to be those projects that either are not meeting their current permit requirements or um, those that have had violations and um, one myth that rolls around um, uh, somewhat regularly is that um, we are one of those bad actors and we're violating or we aren't able to meet our permit. We made a number of bridge improvements over the last five years that got us in compliance with our current permit. We're under review for a new permit. 
and we are not a violator. So um, we aren't discharging raw sewage. We have challenges with INI. And um, I'll probably have Greg talk with you a little bit on kind of what he may be thinking for work plan at the next meeting, but likely what we'll be looking at is how we're treating um, before release, releasing. Right now we're doing it through chlorinization and um, Greg is looking at UV treatment that may resolve and help us with the potential of any discharge violation. Um, again, related to peak I and I, and it's not a fact that we are releasing ever the case of raw sewage. It is what we're having to do with groundwater coming into our system. We chlorinate it, and occasionally when we get those high peaks, we end up having to release. We've got chlorinated water going in, looking at a UV system um, might be a better approach. It's a newer technology. And so that's one of the, um, that's one of the components that Greg is looking at first replacing. So it sounds like a little kudos to the staff then in Greg and team over there for not having violations and for getting those bridge maintenance fixes as well too. The DEQ is a state agency. Am I correct in that? Yes, um, the state revolving loan fund money um, that comes through. It's actually um, very little bit state funding. It's some, um, but it's primarily federal funding that comes through that program. But we're eligible for state revolving loan funds through uh, DEQ, as well as rural development funds directly from the feds as well as there's Army Corps funding. Um, and then there's also a direct federal program, loan program that may very well be a good program for us here. Um, and it's called WIPIA. Uh, so we are actively meeting. In fact, it was just last week, Greg and I met with, I think five representatives from IDEQ and two representatives from the governor's office. So we are very actively engaged in figuring out the um, long-term financing, but with the increase in rates that was needed in order for us to be able to rebuild this plant, um, we do have some of the cash reserves building up that we can start moving forward even with our own projects as we're starting to figure out the financing down the road. Because typically when you're in one of those pools waiting for financing, you're applying one year, the second year, you're gonna, gonna your turn is gonna come up a couple of years down the road. We were specifically advised by DEQ that taking this phased approach would be uh, the most competitive approach for us to be able to get funding. Um, and so uh, Greg and I were already looking at pivoting to a phased approach and ironically have had the conversation and prep for the meeting with the governor's office and DEQ. Uh, and again, it makes sense a build a whole new plant and then moving from one to another is not even a choice in terms of it being the approach if we were looking at relocating to um, the property up on the Baldy site. But again, since we're staying at the location that we are, it facilitates this phased approach, um, which um, I, I think will work best for our ratepayers in the long run as well. We will be coming back to council probably in the next uh, two to three months at the most getting our financing uh, manager on board as we start to look at how we're doing the long-term financing that we have included um, in excess of $6 million in the budget, which will move us forward on design as well as some phase construction. So the foresight to stockpile some money in the coffers in case that didn't come through. Uh, just a comment, I, I find it to be a sad day that you could get federal and state dollars for an affordable housing project that may or may not happen, yet not be able to get state and federal dollars unless your wastewater treatment center pollutes your largest body of water in the surrounding area. Right. The bad players get rewarded. Got it. Yeah. And I think that's what I find, you know, rather than preventative and looking at someone like, you know, Sandpoint going, we're doing all the right things. We've been keeping this together. Thank you, Greg. Mm -hmm. um, and then saying, oh, sorry, you haven't had any violations. So we're not going to help you out. We're not going to give you any money. I think that's just a little bit skewed mm -hmm. in the wrong direction. Yeah. And in terms of the, I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, that's the exact conversation we had IDEQ with IDEQ and they acknowledged that um, sure. The formula and it does create the challenges. So, 
Um, we do think phase three will get funding um, and we'll be very competitive. It just may take us a couple of years to do the yeah. And in, in terms of the point scoring, we weren't even close. We were like middle. Yeah. So it, clearly this is the approach that uh, offers the most opportunity for us. And and um, I think as Tap pointed out, I think it makes all the sense in the world considering we're, we're really just renovating an existing plant. We're not building a new, I mean, at the end of the day, it will all be rebuilt, but um, to really continue with the bridged approach that we've already undertaken um, really makes the most sense. And, and it is going to be the most cost effective for our ratepayers at the end and also um, gives us the great, greatest likelihood of getting that um, that financing support that we're looking for. Yeah. And, and just one more time. Thank you to staff. Thank you to yeah. Greg for making that place continue uh, the way you yes. have over the years. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> Mr. Mayor, I do think it's important to emphasize again that we have not given up on the notion of regionalizing either as we continue to see growth um, in our area and other sewer utilities um, maybe at the brink. We are still looking at a plant that could accommodate connection in from other partners in the area, so we have not moved away from that and would be allowed for phasing for future growth. So we're looking at, we'll be looking at replacement to meet Sandpoint's needs, but we've had conversations about opportunities from connection with others that continue to exist because we do have to address that I and I flow. But during this time of year, when that is not the case, um, again, we can accommodate even with our existing plan, actually more connections onto our system. Um, than what we have currently um, with our current plan. So, uh, and that will be the case moving forward. So we have not moved away from the notion of regionalization. We had a lot of conversations with IDEQ about that. They support regionalization as does the governor's office. And so um, there's, and they indicated to us in, in that meeting, they provide some points to encourage that, but honestly, it's not a lot of points. It just moves you up a little bit more. Um, and they're looking for signed agreements between partners. So right now where we're at is we can accommodate, although we are continuing to have discussions with partners around us and we'll continue to plan for regionalization because we do believe it's what's best for the environment. Um, it brings where you're serving water, you actually have uh, sewer as opposed to septic. Uh, so um, the administrative direction on that has not changed at all. Any other questions, Council? Okay. <clears throat> Please note that the that public comment will not be taken this evening, but we're reserved for the public hearing that will be scheduled for August 16th. I will entertain a motion for city council to adopt the fiscal year 2024 preliminary budget, declare intent to use foregone levying authority to both use and reserve foregone amounts, and schedule the annual budget public hearing for August 16th, 2023. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. So moved and seconded. This will be a roll call vote. There's no further discussion. Councilor Rule? Yes. Councilor McAllister? Yes. Councilor Walker? Yes. Councilor Spurl? Yes. Councilor Dick? Yes. Preliminary budget is approved. The final item on the agenda this evening is a review of city fees and city council will schedule a public hearing to consider proposed new fees and existing fee, fee and existing fees proposed to increase more than 5%. I'll now yield the floor again to city administrator Jennifer Pearson Stapleton. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, I'm actually going to yield to our finance director treasurer Sarah. We know how she loves to present on things, and I am going to <laughs> yeah. back up to her in this case. <laughs> um, good evening. Uh, I'll go quickly over the um, new fees and then the fees above five percent. Um, this is again just a schedule of public hearing, um, and then also to get the fees that are under the five percent. Um, then we have a, several new fees. Um, one is a foreign um, fund processing fee. This is just to recoup um, the, the bank fees and then also the administration of the foreign funds. Mostly this is Canadian people paying um, with foreign funds. It actually does, um, we have to deposit it separately. It's a separate fee that comes from the bank. So this is just to encourage using um, US funds. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and then the next one is a late application processing fee for alcohol catering permits. Um, and some um, permit fees for fire alarm sprinklers, floodplain development permit reviews, building fire structural reviews. These are all reviews that we're currently doing that either one we're not charging for or we're not recouping if we do send them out for external review. So this is just recouping the costs that we're already um, doing. Um, the meter lock removal fee, this was discussed during our utility rate study process of um, customers who remove locks. So this is going to be a fee that would be tacked on if they actually cut the lock that we have put on there so, so they cannot turn on their meters. Um, a leak check, um, this is a customer requested um, only leak check if, and it's only if a customer has um, on their, so we do a continuous flow monitoring um, every month. And if it comes back that it's been continuously flow for 24 hours, it is um, flagged as a leak potential um, customer. Um, if there isn't continuous flow that um, indicates that from our end of the meter, there is no leak. Um, so this, it would be a customer who is requesting an additional, um, basically check on something that we're saying there is not a leak um, that we have detected in the, in the monitoring. This, and, and usually what happens is that a, um, a utility will, will go out there and there isn't a leak. So it's just a, this is also a deterrent to, I guess, a cost that would recoup our time to go out and do, do that. Um, mortgage fees, these are, these are proposed fees over 5% mortgage fees. There are a few of them that we um, determined that needed to increase more than um, the regular CPI. There is parked um, facing the wrong direction. When we went um, so a couple of years ago, we reassessed um, several of the parking um, or the law enforcement um, fees that we had. And this was one of them we did not increase. The, just the usage of time and cost to administer this fine um, was determined that we needed to increase it this year. Can I ask what that fee is? I, I, I know it's on the schedule lower down, but I don't have my laptop open right now. Do you know what it is off the top of your head? Um, it was it 10, went from 10, 10 to 25. $10. It was 10, and I it, think it went. Yeah, it was at 10, and it went to 25, I believe. Can I request that we raise that to like $1,000? <laughs> that's, that's one of the most obnoxious behaviors I see in Sandpoint. <laughs> I think that Councilman uh, Welter does that. No. <laughs> Not in Sam point. <laughs> <laughs> and then the remaining fees that are above um, 5%, those are all tied in one way or another to um, um, personnel costs. So they've either increased the 6% or the 10%. So um, down below, is the, um, as, as in the past, we highlight the ones that are changing and put either new or the percent next to it. This is the entire fee um, schedule that is attached here. So there is um, 15 pages of them. It's tiny, but it does um, blow up if you look at it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah, so if we do want to read it, it is possible. It, it is. Okay. just got to blow it up. I was going to ask if you could make it smaller next time. <laughs> Don't worry. Jennifer asked me that every time. Uh, and I say, I can. <laughs> <laughs> I can. Um, anyways, I'm not going to go through one by one, but they all are um, on this fee schedule. So. so for clarity again, I know this is, council knows this, but for the public as well, um, under Idaho state law, the city is required, if we are charging fees for anything, um, we have to have an adopted fee schedule. We can't make up fees. Our fees have to be on a schedule. So our fee schedules exist out on our city website. Citizens can check it throughout the year. Any fee that we're charging is, again, uh, on the schedule. Our adjustments to our fees annually, we're typically doing uh, some adjustments, as Sarah mentioned, um, that are, and we've taken two approaches with it. Um, one is CPI. So for example, boat mortgage, where you're seeing increases in boat mortgage, you're generally seeing a, um, there were a couple that we needed to clean up because we've got power and a couple of other things, but generally across the board in boat, boat, boat mortgage, what you see is a, um, in, a proposed increase that is commensurate with the CPI. Um, so we're recovering costs for a capital project, future capital improvements. So we have our parks capital improvement funds and those fees go into our park capital improvement funds. You will see in other areas, so those um, increases are in the 4% range because that's where current CPI came in. 
Um, and you will see in other areas then where we are charging for permits and um, you're gonna see an increase there um, closer to 6%. You will see over on law enforcement, you will see um, for some of the services and associated, associated increase that is more in the range of 10%. So those are associated with time. So CPI doesn't really fit with that. It's what is our time, what are our staff costing costing us. So with um, market adjustments and with COLA, that's where you're seeing that association where you've got fees at 4% or at, excuse me, 6% or 10%. It's because it's time associated with that. Whereas when it's more things, you're seeing a CPI increase of about 4%. So again, we have posted up on our website, the full fee schedule. Um, your highlights are going to be where it's new or you have fee increases over 5%, but anywhere we are proposing a fee increase, you are seeing what that proposed increase is, the percentage associated with that on the full fee schedule. When we go to publish this for a public hearing, we are referencing back to our full fee schedule, but we're publishing fees over 5% um, and new fees in accordance with state law. The action before uh, council tonight is uh, again a request to schedule a public hearing, take public comment on proposed fees, and that would be at the August 16th council meeting. Thank you, Jennifer and Sarah. Appreciate that presentation. Staff, uh, staff, council, any further questions? Uh, just a quick comment here. Uh, the late application processing fee, um, I'm certainly guilty of coming in late, sometime due to my own fault, <laughs> sometime due to our clients and short notice. Uh, the city of Sandpoint and the staff has been absolutely amazing. Uh, when I have had to come in last minute and get it, I totally understand the additional $20. Most of what we do when we get alcohol permits are for nonprofit gala events like Panhandle Alliance for Education or the Heartball through the Bonner General Health Foundation. Um, and I think I'm going to continue on this, not understanding what our state is doing because of Senate Bill 1120 uh, that just took into effect on July 1st that seriously hampers our ability to sell our liquor license, which is a asset as seen by the IRS. We are no longer allowed to lease our liquor license. It's, we just found out from alcohol beverage control that our annual fee will go up 40% for the unintended consequence of 1120 and a shortfall in their budget over $500,000, all going back on the liquor license holder. So just wanna make sure our customers and our nonprofits are understanding of those of us that have paid a lot of money for our liquor licenses by playing with the state of Idaho's quota rules that have been in place since 1957, the amount of cost and the inability to sell that asset or to lease that asset as of July 1st today. Thank you. <clears throat> Anything else, counselors? Okay. Please note again that public comment will not be taken this evening, but will be reserved for the public hearing that will be scheduled for August 16th. So I would entertain a motion to schedule a public hearing for August 16th, 2023, to consider proposed new fees and existing fees proposed to increase more than 5%. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. Been moved and seconded. This will be a roll call vote if there's no further discussion. Councillor Dick? Yes. Councillor Rule? Yes. Councillor Spurl? Yes. Councillor McAllister? Yes. Councillor Walker? Yes. Motion passes and this meeting is adjourned. Thank you, everyone.